Just let me begin um, with a very brief set of introductions. Fritz insists that he needs no introduction, so I actually won't be introducing him, other than saying two things. And uh, since 1985, Fritz has been at the helm of James Joyce, uh, sorry, Zurich James Joyce Foundation. Um, and uh, in 54 years ago, in 1967, Fritz was among the first conveners of the very first Dublin Symposium. And uh, next year, we'll be celebrating the 55th anniversary of that, of that great event. We all know Fritz's work from, from uh, a few books that were put together. And he is, of course, a fixture uh, in James Joyce schools in both Dublin and in Trieste. Uh, Armani Kichi is an independent scholar who translates, and also a translator, he translates uh, English uh, literature into Turkish. Uh, in, among them are Poe and Lewis Carroll, and of course, James Joyce's uh, Ulysses that was published in 2012. And today, it is being probably republished as a as a in a fourth edition. So that's a that's a pretty impressive run there. Now, Erika Mikalica is a professor, associate professor uh, in Babish Bolai University. She's also a translator, and she brought out uh, um, Beckett and Orwell and O'Brien and oh, Carson, yeah. an am amazing array of writers into uh, Hungarian language. Um, uh, her most recent criticism, as did uh, uh, Armand's, appeared in, among others, a book retranslating Joyce for 21st century, which Erica co-edited with me, with yours truly here. So, um, uh, and I am uh, Yolanta Wawrzycka. I have been at Radford University for 34 years. Uh, recently, they uh, took pity on me, awarded me some nice um, uh, eminent scholar thing. So I'm just like, Brad, Brad. Anyway, um, uh, uh, my most pr proud achievement uh, thus far is translation of Joyce's uh, chamber music. I try to replicate exactly what Joyce did, of course, in another language. And I am uh, uh, very proud of my students. They drive me and uh, I take them to conferences in Rome and in Trieste and Zurich. So that is who I I am. Okay. So now, uh, without much more ado, let me pass it on to Fritz, who will introduce the scope of our session, whose title is a, a bit misleading by now, but Fritz will take care of that. So, so the subject is translation. Uh, most of you know what it is. We have three practicing translators and me. I can tell you what you do wrong. <clears throat> now, I start with two statements I heard. Many of you have heard it before, but it's worth saying. On the one hand, we have the advice of Stephen James Joyce, who said, you must not change a single word. On the other hand, we have somebody walking in at the foundation doing uh, Finnegan's Wake, and we talked with him, he said, what's the use of a translation if it says the same thing as the original? Between two each poles, we can uh, cooperate. And of course, we realize uh, we know what translation is, or we think we know. Um, uh, not all that easy, and the choice doesn't make it easier. Now, with the Oxen chapter, we have a, another, another aspect, a temporal dimension. Uh, it is the one episode uh, where the language at the beginning is different from uh, the end. Uh, that's uh, a bit unique. Um, and, that's, and, and we have, of course, the, the whole development, gestation, uh, you said, um, and that has to be uh, has to be done in some way. We know, of course, that you compare the development of language with a, a biological embryo and, and all of that, that we know. The question is really, how do you, do we do this in English? Uh, Joyce was fortunate. There's a lot of centuries of English progress from old English, I think, but not every culture has the same opportunity. It, it depends on, you might say, the availability of documents. Uh, that's what it is. And not every language had the visible scope of uh, over that. And so what do you do? Quite apart from the fact that of course used the history of English language 
and you might ask, shouldn't it be perhaps uh, uh, you go to the translations of the various English authors? You know, but there aren't enough many. I don't think I don't think Mandeville is in, uh, available in every in every language and things like that. So, uh, what kind of uh, tricks do you do you use when? We are at the uh, obviously uh, have have a, di uh, a dilemma now. Joyce, in a way, outsourced this chapter to various uh, undertake or uh, demiurgos uh, things like that, and and did of course a uh, fake. He he was in control uh, of themselves, but we know what he was doing. It's so obvious. But what do translators do that have don't have this kind of uh, this kind of uh, scope. Uh, translation is always, I believe, opportunistic. You need an opportunity. If you don't, by the way, Joyce too used opportunities. In, in English, it happens that the word world is one letter away from word, but that isn't true of most of our languages. So it is. So, I think. so uh, that is uh, to prepare yourself a little bit and we will, we will uh, uh, use a few examples, and <clears throat> I thought it's best, by the way, when you have examples, everybody can listen. When you, when I talk abstractly about theory of translation, not everybody has great inclinations, perhaps, to listen. And another question, what do theories of translation help translators? Somebody said, uh, translation theory is as important uh, as Ornithology is to birds, uh, so we have we have to do to do some. And I started, or we start with very simple sentences. Go back to the beginning, to the kind of semblance of old English. It's not it's not old English. It's, um, it's um, Sainsbury's uh, artificial thing, and uh, we have a short, uh, yeah, short uh, thing, and we start with uh, something at the beginning, a kind of fake old English, a stark ruth of man, his errand that him lone led till that house. First of all, I think you probably agree that this is a sentence to be read slowly. You hardly hurry it. Uh, also because you don't quite get all of it at the first. Uh, and they are strong words, and I think you're almost invited to dwell on every word. Mm -hmm. That's a feature I always see in Joyce. When a, a phrase or a word comes into our attention, when we hear it or when we read it, it achieves its full glory and, and, and the whole value of it. Here we have Central European languages, with the others then are a little bit more strange. Uh, I come to this. You have the first uh, German one, and everybody knows German, will have no difficulty following it. Tiefes Mitleid mentioned was the Grund, der den einsamen nach diesem Haus trieb. The second one is quite different, and I will treat it separately. And you can see, even if you're familiar with German, you may have words. All the words I uh, underlined are not, you don't find them. Uh, meet the barman and think I'll come to that. Now, I have some French and Italian, and my impression is, but I could be wrong, I that every line of choice and Italian screen and then we'll probably have little different, and Swiss different and difficulties with them. It seems to be good. Maybe a word is a bit old and things like that. So, uh, on the whole, the whole uh, uh, tinge, the kind of uh, period uh, uh, tint doesn't seem to be too pronounced in those uh, languages. But now I go to the second German one. Um, and then I check. Can you do the next? Then you're, mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you see, I, I do something that's didactically wrong by underlining things uh, that direct your attention but of course you would have found your way anyway. It's a good word to begin with Ruth because it's a word that we don't know and yet we do. Uh, we know ruthless, Ruth, uh, pity, uh, 
compassion, things like that. So it's a word that does no longer exist, but some of their relatives are around, so we could easily uh, guess that. A man is errant at him, lone led till that house. We have this alliteration, which is in Germanic verse, uh, at the beginning it's pronounced. And we have as one little uh, um, diversion, the word till, that in modern English, we only use temporarily till next one but not spatially. So it is a bit different. The first uh, on top is uh, uh, in ordinary German. That is the first translation that is. But um, in the second one that was done about in the 60s, um, uh, 70s, uh, by Wolfsleger and when Klaus Reichert, my old friend, uh, joined. He thought one could use what the German language offers because the German language has changed probably much more than English has. And so we have words that you know, uh, the red one, mit der Barmen, it doesn't exist. We have mit light, compassion, or erbarmen. So this is a kind of artificial word that may or may not have existed. Then we have the spelling of was, was, um, uh, was and gebracht is also uh, in the old spelling. And this who's, um, uh, in German, we had a diphthongization, who's, well, it was originally, still is in Swiss German, and that became house. And then to Adds to the difficulties. We even spelled it with a V in the way of the old thing. So here we have uh, something that goes in a different direction. Normally, inevitably, regrettably, uh, things tend to be flattened. The, the particular things are ironed out. And here, uh, it's the opposite. Here, the English uh, is easier to read, the original is easier to read than uh, the German. That may be a wrong approach, but the, uh, as often, and this will be one of our topics, uh, the question often is, how do I mark something unique? Either I do not mark it at all, or I mark it slightly different, but at least the difference can be seen. So that is now the um, extraordinary thing that for once the translation reads much more uh, more difficult. And if you're not uh, if you're not very good in German, I know a little bit, you may you will really have a, a trouble with it quite apart from the spelling. That was me. So we have it alienated, <laughs> not domesticated to a degree that is quite unusual. So I think it's good as a counterexample. But now I think we go on uh, to the. Uh, by the way, we proceed horizontally. Oh no, I still have that. Um, horizontally, uh, that we do one example and pass it around from language uh, to language. I think now you can take over. All right. So, so still the same thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, so you will see on alliterations. Yeah, you will see on top. Cultures, current tradition do not use alliteration at all. But here it's a clear thing for Anglo-Saxon or Old German. Well, so uh, thank you. So I have. Okay. Um, so you can see that this is. You go to your language now. Okay, thank you. Um, so you can see that um, my translation uh, from Polish is my own text that I am discussing here today. And uh, it, it's not on yet. It is. Oh, I don't see it. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, I was wrong. let me start over. Okay. So um, indeed, uh, what Fritz mentioned uh, earlier when he was talking about his, uh, his slide, uh, Polish is rather impoverished in terms of what we can do at, uh, imitating Joyce's, the development of Joyce's uh, of styles in, in, in mm -hmm. Polish. We have no robust uh, uh, medieval uh, literature at all, so one has to somehow fake the style. Um, alliteration in my language is well and, and, and it's, it's 
quite healthy, so you can do that. Um, I need to look at vocabulary changes. So I will use a more antiquated vocabulary when I can, but I have to also make sure that it is understood and recognizable for, to the audience. And I can play along with the syntax a little bit. Um, I am very tuned to sound and uh, that was actually, that came from translating uh, uh, chamber music where I, I really elaborated on how sound uh, drives the, uh, the meaning. Fritz is a note about stark Ruth of man, his errand that him lone led till that house is well, uh, taken. You need to read it slowly. So let me now show you how I uh, uh, in those uh, how I uh, uh, rendered this sentence in uh, Polish. So uh, click maybe yes. So you'll see what I try to do here. Czysta litość bliźniemu posłanie mu była, co przywiodła go samego w owy dom. It does not quite read like English, obviously, because it's Polish, but it, 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 I'm trying to render sort of a mellifluous flow of this, of this sentence. And there are two things that I would like to uh, point out, uh, well, three things. First, you will see in green that I'm trying to uh, 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 preserve some of the sibilanty, shimmery kind of sound, but also the uh, low Li, wa, we, those are fluid uh, uh, and, and similar to English uh, uh, sound. Um, but then when you go to uh, go sa me go von I am uh, substituting the uh, 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 low into o oh, go, o oh, go. So that there's a different sound introduced, but uh, the effect remains the same. And the last thing I want to say about the sentence is that the third word in Polish, you will see that I have changed the color for fellow man and the penultimate word uh, uh, onidom, those are, uh, the first one uh, antiquizes the, the, if that's the word, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the uh, syntax a little bit. And oni, the, the, the penultimate word, we don't really use that word anymore, but you can definitely see that this is a, a, mm -hmm. an attempt to render this a, a little bit, sounding a little bit older. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you can click again, Arman, thank you. Uh, you're on to, uh, 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 you're yes. Uh, Fritz, oh, you're Fritz, you're muted. Perhaps uh, the, the, the moderators can unmute. I'm, I'm asking him to unmute, but he has to click unmute. Thank you, Rahel. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Thank Sorry, you. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought I was always off. No, the question is, what the, would the average educated poll look, what would be strange? to them. Um, Czysta litość bliźniemu, that's the syntax that is antiquated, mm -hmm. as well as the last the, in, in blue, jego samego w one dom, that is not what we would say mm -hmm. today. So yes. that would be a, a, an attempt, a, 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 that would a, a signal to the reader that this is a, a, a slightly different. Now, what I am also very attracted to in Joyce is this wonderful rhythmic uh, 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 prose, Stark Ruth, you can see that I did here, Czysta in other words, two, or two syllable words. But I can also do it and that would, uh, you can see the uh, translation underneath, uh, the rest of the translation runs well. And some in he, uh, this case is, is, a, is, is an emphatic word that Peter alone, nothing else but that led him there. But it repeats the samego, meaning him alone. So the, the, semantically, these words are very different, but uh, visually and, and sound-wise, they, they tell you, uh, uh, again, that uh, 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 why Bloom comes there. But uh, let's click on the last one. I cannot really use the second option, the Samjal, for the simple reason that Fritz already mentioned that the litosh, that, that Ruth, uh, appears also in other words, so ruthful and all ruthful. Uh, so I would have to stick with uh, uh, that, uh, that, that word in order to preserve some kind of unity that Joyce is doing. As you will see when I continue, that is something that, that is very uh, important to me. Can I use the very same word that Joyce uses <coughs> in a very different situation? Can I use that word in other semantic meanings where we would normally use a different word? So I highlight these uh, a little bit later. Thank you. Yeah, that's yet another difficulty, hmm? yeah. that the same phrases occur elsewhere. Yeah. But that's a general problem. Yeah.
Uh, so here, oh yeah, I'm here on again. So let's see. Uh, and here, oh, the, re the, the reason that we have these two Ruths on, on, on slide is because those are the only two times that Ruth appears throughout Ulysses and it's only in Oxen, but also it appears in a vicinity of loath to leave, loath to irk. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, again, uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to see whether in the same, whether the same word can be uh, uh, used in, this, in, in both situations. So uh, the loth to irk, uh, irk is here uh, rendered. Okay, you can go on, go on. Yes, yes. So uh, it, it, it's a sort of different kind of green, but uh, it, it, it would be green, right? Now, the problem in, my, in this sentence is that the gorgeous four uh, time uh, uh, alliteration uh, cannot be sustained in my language, but I'm doing two and two in different, with different letters, as you can see. So you can highlight that again. So hat holding, duoni jerron, so we've got the same letters uh, uh, at least uh, here. And uh, the seeker stood, and as Vendrovitz Trau has to be moved into the middle of the sentence for the simple syntactical reasons. There is a way where I could put it at the end, but it would be very, very clumsy. So, so I'm keeping it uh, the way it is. Now, if the reader reads this, they will be already taken off a little bit by Holu Horna and Vendrovitz's Trau Kapelus Duoni Jerzons. It is not a very fluent, Polish centers uh, of the modern day, but again, I am uh, uh, trying to uh, replicate in whole horn, hard haunting the seeker stood. Okay, and the last thing on this slide is, is this the end? Oh no, this, uh, we're going on to, to uh, no, this is it, right? So we don't have anything more on this slide, so we can move on, thank you. So I looked at the same sentence in the two Turkish translations. Maybe before I start, so I can say a couple of things about the development of Turkish. It is indeed, as Fritz said, different than English. So there are texts going back to, to the 5th, 6th centuries, but they are much fewer than English. And also they, are, they have very different subjects and language. So if you had done something like a really century by century mapping, you would have a basis um, language vocabulary that is dealing with very different things. And that would very probably not be useful for this translation because also you want to convey the meaning. And um, also the, the language changed differently. So the language of, for example, uh, 13th, 14th century folk poetry is quite understandable still today. But then Turkish went through a period of strong influence from Arabic and Persian as classical languages. And the more learned, the more formal you were, the more these abstract words that were derived from Arabic or Persian, or actually even invented in Turkish in Arabic or Persian in your, in your text. And ironically, this thing came to a, to a maybe a, to a summit around 1910, 1920, with the first modernist under the influence of Baudelaire and Verlaine trying to create this rich symbolic language. And they created some of the most archaic sounding poetry for a reader today. So most of the from, uh, if you would really imitate Turkish from let's say 15 to early 19th century, you would need a dictionary and actually even to create that is a specialty, which I didn't have. <laughs> and you could make it even more difficult because also we changed the script a couple of times. So for centuries, we used the Arabic Persian script. There's a period written by runes. So you could even make that if you had a specialty and produce this text really unreadable, except for, uh, for the um, specialists. Uh, both Erkman and myself, and Erkman is also quite a late translation. Uh, we were fighting against the idea that it is impossible to translate, impossible to understand. So while not being not naive and actually trying to really translate to the verbal features, both of us were also clearly trying to make it understandable. And uh, you can see it actually quite clearly in the opening of Oxen, where Erkman chooses for a full page for this Latin influenced chaotic paragraphs, a rich Ottoman formal language, as if uh, like a order from the Sultan, with long words, long sentences, all the old words, uh, but actually it's quite structured. So if you have the patience and read it, it has good syntax. And he's also not naive. He's putting in these jokes in the first 
page, there are three French loan words that became only Turkish words in 20th century. So you see, he's actually almost like sticking his um, hand out and saying that, look, this is all a joke, it's all artifice. So here I am, translator, I'm, I'm making fun of you. So he's doing that, doing that gesture. In my case, um, my, what I try to do is that to imitate the experience of uh, an English reader who is reading that text. And if you look at the first page, it is mostly understandable words. Just the syntax is a mess. It is completely ungrammatical syntax. So I tried to also create this ungrammatical Turkish, which has this cloud of meaning similar to that. Mm -hmm. uh, that first example uh, is actually maybe uh, not looking too good on Turkish translators. Both of us are quite flattening the text in trying to explain to the reader what's happening. Uh, but it is not as bad as that. So in the, in the coming examples, we will see also we are also trying. Uh, Erkman's sentence is quite straightforward. It's like a regular children's story. So after doing that Ottoman shock, then he is maybe helping the reader like a nice storyteller at bedtime. Uh, what I see there kind of not flat is the, his choice for loan. Uh, and Bloom in Turkish, in his Turkish, is not only alone, but he is, he is um, he's forlorn. So he has no friends or relatives. So there's a strong adjective is there. But, but if you look at other things there, like his of man, his Adam, is quite strange in modern English. So we don't do that. So we don't have equivalent strange thing there. Uh, what I try to do, I, I play with the word order a bit to make it a bit strange. And at the end, you see this word, idi. Uh, that is old grammar. So it is not really used anymore. There's a past tense in an archaic sense. But even that, actually, this too is the same thing. So even that, I'm giving it with, with, uh, with uh, very kid gloves. So first, I'm the first part of sentence in modern grammar. And at the end, I do an archaism um, gesture. And um, yeah, I think. Besides that, we have the same problem. So how do you translate Stark? Is Lone, is Bloom alone? Or is it the only reason? In Erkman's both Bloom is alone and that is the only reason. And in mine, that is the only reason. So these are the choices that the translators make. Yeah. And we go on to yeah, Armand, uh, yes. that Lone, you, you relate to the only thing, not that let Bloom alone as somebody alone. So is that yes. how you told it? Yes. And I'd like to say something else, another handicap. English can do monosyllables. Yes. So our sentence has only errant that sticks out. And you could actually probably write a novel with monosyllable, but all the inflected languages simply can't do that. Nobody's fault. Yeah. Yeah. If you would choose uh, Turkic roots, then you could have roots of one or two syllables. Mm -hmm. But like this Merhamet root, that's the Arabic word. So at least three syllables. <laughs> and now you have to inflect, inflect all of these. So on to Roy. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Roman. Um, I'm going to speak today about the, uh, the two remaining translations. Uh, the, the first is the, the classic canonical translation um, <clears throat> published in 84. Uh, by poet Mircea Demescu. I'm sorry for the voice, I'm, I'm struggling with bad cold and this is the most that <clears throat> I can manage at the moment. Um, the, uh, the retranslation, which is, um, uh, which is in progress, but uh, Oxen has been uh, completed, it, it, it's possible that some changes will um, still be added to it. Um, it it's forthcoming uh, next year. Uh, it, it's planned to appear to, to be published on, on, on the very day that uh, the, the book first came out and on Joyce's birthday. Um, and um, even at, uh, uh, at a casual look at, uh, at, at the two chapters, um, one can see quite, uh, quite radical differences. Um, first, a few words about the, um, the canonical translation by Velasco. Um, when it came out, it, uh, it was an absolute event. It, it's quite a spectacular translation. It's, um, um, first of all, it's, uh, it's a thorough cultural translation, transdaptation, perhaps one, one might call it a travesty. Um, what it does is, um, uh, is actually uh, take um, a, a shortcoming or something that, uh, that could have been 
viewed as a, um, as a drawback, uh, be the fact that Romanian literacy has, um, goes back about uh, 500 years, be the first extant document in the language dates from the, from the second half of the, um, the 16th century. So, <clears throat> um, the um, uh, the way that uh, Ivanescu compensates it to, um, to to render the the effect of constant linguistic change a variety um, of uh, um, uh, lending um, adding distinction to uh, um, and uh, distinctiveness to, to every um, single passage is uh, by a combination of techniques. Um, first of all, he, he resorts to, um, to, to thorough cultural translation of absolutely everything from, <clears throat> from the Aria to, um, to culturally specific titles, concepts. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this he couples with, um, uh, with a systemic uh, foreign language substitution. So um, in the first centuries of, uh, of Romanian literacy, um, Old Church Slavonic was the, uh, the, the language of the church, and uh, it, it heavily suffused all the all the extant text documents, um, those annals, those chronicles, um, which means that um, um, for the uh, for the passages of old uh, corresponding to Old English and Middle English, uh, Ivanescu resorts to to a heavily um, Slavic infected lexis. Um, some of these words are uh, today archaic, and some of they, some of them have been ousted. Um, some of them merely have a have an obsolete ring, uh, ring. Um, as most of the the current vocabulary of Romanian would be um, would be of Latin um, origin. This is also the result of, um, uh, <clears throat> of a thorough um, language renewal movement uh, that uh, that started at the end of the 18th century and <clears throat> went on through most of the, uh, the 20th, sorry. Um, what you can see in this, um, um, in this first passage is uh, a very different rhythm. Uh, by the way, uh, Romanian doesn't have um, domestic, um, domestic tradition of alliterative poetry, um, only very rarely in, in folk poetry. Um, so there is not, uh, not, not this aspect, not the stylistic aspect, aspect to, uh, to, to fall back on. <clears throat> and um, second, monosyllables are mostly impossible in, in Romance languages. So um, some of these uh, sentences would actually have the, the rhythm of litanies. They, they could be chanted um, in, uh, uh, in Romanian. And some, um, um, some of the later examples, as you'll see, are quite considerably longer than, um, <clears throat> than, than the English counterparts. Um, the um, this particular sentence doesn't um, doesn't actually estrange um, the the language from the from the present day Romanian reader, uh, although it comes with uh, with two words right at the beginning that uh, <clears throat> that the two have this strong um, obsolete touch. Um, it, it's a combination of the the syntax of uh, obsolete forms um, of um, inflections um, and uh, obsolete word word forms that, um, that it works with. Now, um, Radish Moldovan's forthcoming um, version of, uh, <clears throat> of Oxen um, tries, to, um, tries to achieve this effect of linguistic change uh, by, uh, by, by not, um, uh, not, not replicating these, uh, uh, these English literary styles and then phases of language um, uh, with anything that happened um, in, um, in the Romanian tradition. Um, he, he doesn't, uh, doesn't work with Slavic vocabulary only um, or very occasionally. Um, what, he does uh, what he does instead is um, work quite a lot with internal translations. Uh, not uh, not in the translation of the sentence proper, but um, uh, you can see the um, uh, in the various forms proposed for Ruth. Uh, Ruth, by the way, is not carried out as a um, as a um, straightforward repetition. Um, but uh, in one case, uh, the um, <clears throat> the bowels Ruthful, uh, the word for bowels 
is uh, uh, is actually a fake word um, that uh, that comes from Latin. It is a word that never made it into Romanian vocabulary. Um, so uh, Moldovan uh, fakes this word uh, uh, force marches it, force marches it back into uh, into Romanian, um, changing it uh, into uh, being three. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. So we have one more example of Fritz. I just want to come back to the vowels. Um, you connect uh, the roots with vowels, roots, and godal roots. Now, if the sentence begins with roof, which is a strange word that you will observe because you don't know it, do you recognize it when that? Somebody is yeah, talking. Please, uh, please mute your, uh, your mics, please. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so I have the floor, yeah? So <laughs> if the first word is not remarkable, you may not recognize it in the others. You know? So the, the, these are additional things. And uh, you realize it, uh, the sentences get much, much longer, of course. Now we're back to... German again. Uh, there's another sentence where you can see what we did. Watchers tray their walk, white sisters in ward, sleepless. Here the alliteration is quite obvious. And you realize also how through the veil of some strange uh, refraction, uh, we still can't see what it means. I think the, the sentence still speaks to our uh, emotions. I will, uh, <laughs> And here now in the, uh, that shows to what extreme they went. They used Westerinnen, which in the bottom line will be the modern German, and it's spelled quite different. Twain, uh, German also has a dialect, two different words for two. They walk, white sisters in war. And here you can see we have Wiese, white, Wiese, uh, now it's Weiss, but it ain't was Wies. So we have it before the diphthongation. Again, it's farther removed from what you understand. And I'm not quite sure that every hopeful reader of the German translation will have much a desire to go on with all these obstacles here. Uh, and you can just see how it would be in, uh, in modern German. So it is uh, removed from it with really the uh, the effect that it reads much more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, the beginning rocks in, in the original is almost easy mm -hmm. for whatever comfort that is for you. Okay. So now we go to the same in Polish. Yes. So uh, th this is one of my favorite sentences. Of course, there's about a other hundred thousand of them there. But anyway, Tway. Uh, uh, the watchers tway they walk white sister in what word sleepless now uh, if you can click uh, 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 arman the, the big problem for me in polish because of inflection is who or what is sleepless and uh, i did peek at my predecessor who makes the sisters sleepless uh, now uh, the way i rendered the sentence uh, uh, i show it to you right now in a so if you click uh, uh, thank you uh, click again so now what you will see in blue that i am going for sibilants and plosives okay so uh, watchers struski that well, you could you could say that it's similar to a polish uh, ear twade vujkami again very lucky coincidence walk drożo i chose rather antiquated word for walking and the white and biawe, I mark it in different color because it's one of those very lucky coincidences when the w in Polish, is, uh, the, the L with the slash reads like w. So you could say the white and biawe is kind of a reversal, sort of a chiasmic uh, uh, little uh, uh, formation there. And again, lucky me, sisters and siostry works very well. And then sleepless and nishpionce. Now, that is a little bit sticky point for me because I said that in a hole that doesn't 
and sleep, and it may be good when you describe it or back translate it, but it doesn't really sound terribly good in Polish. So my next solution is to uh, render the end of the word as uh, sisters who are walking in hall niespania of no sleep. And that is also not terribly, terribly good. So my third solution, which I don't know if it's any better, is in a, a white, uh, uh, in a word sleepless, uh, uh, holu gdzie nie śpią. Śpią is a third uh, is a third person plural, so they do not sleep. And now when you hearken back to the original, it would, it could qualify sisters that do not sleep, but also words that do not sleep, considering that we have, you know, all these birthing women in the world who are uh, uh, and therefore words are sleepless. Don't know if it's a good solution, don't know if anybody they will ever split hair like that, like myself. But those are just to show you that I'm quite concerned with keeping the rhythm of Joyce's sentence, keeping some kind of resonance of, 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 of uh, similar uh, 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 sounds, and also keeping some kind of near rhythm. So if you look, watchers tway the walk, white sister inward sleepless, the bottom is biawe siostry w holu nieśpiącym. You can see that I'm going both for the sound and for the rhythm, and of course for the meaning, which is, which is the harder part. Now, the second part of that sentence, uh, uh, sleepless, uh, uh, sorry, smart day uh, still and sickness uh, soothing, um, to Polish person, the, the, the sibilants are not terribly soothing. So in, in my books, it belies a little bit the semantic message of what the sisters are doing. And lucky me again, in Polish, I could say bule koją dłości łagodzą. You can hear the mellifluous sound of the, of, in the predominance of vowel formations. And to me, that is much more soothing. So I, uh, and fortunately, it is also semantically uh, uh, relevant to, to, to what, uh, to what the sentence is doing. So uh, enough of that for me. Thank you. Next slide. <laughs> I'm looking at the same, same sentence in the two Turkish translations. Um, again, Arkman is kind of flattening here, so there are just two regular sentences without any, any alteration. Um, not even the word order, so it is just a flat sentence. Here I'm trying to alterate. And then uh, when we found ourselves in this situation, and in Turkish, we don't often have uh, words of, that are cognates to the English. We have some, but not very often, so we don't have sister. Uh, so you, 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 you end up choosing one word and trying to see what words alterate with that. So then, so I've, this is my solution. So I'm alterating with the, with the uh, sound call. So you see, call, you call, lar, koshta. And I, I alternate with the, with the syllable ak, aklar, bakıcılar. So to do that, then actually I'm, I'm doing what, what Stephen Joyce didn't want us to do. I'm changing the words. Uh, for example, for sister, I use bakıcı. But in Turkish, you would use for a female nurse, hemşire, which is the Arabic word for sister. So bakıcı would mean something else. Would mean either a male nurse, orderly, or, or, or could, could be even the doorkeeper. So, so then I expect people to understand because I want to illustrate with ak, the, the old word for white, and still current to the basic word for white. And then, uh, so indeed, so this is, um, this is what we do as translators, as we try to imitate what the text is doing, sometimes we change the words. And I think we go back to German. Yeah, it's another. Uh... <coughs> a similar sentence beginning, also very alliterative, <laughs> and you have to realize how through all this foreignness, we can see Bloom a, a little bit embarrassed with his hat uh, in his hands. Uh, that's another thing. It, it has a direct, I believe, impact on us, even as it's strange. Loath to Irking Horn Hall had hold of the seat, it's good. And then again, we have uh, uh, something that in German wouldn't be easy. It's easy for our audience, of course, because they're all very intellectual and sophisticated. But to stören denied nicht, so the alliteration is in the word. Uh, this you could say to stören nicht geneigt. Hurt in hand, hat, that was hurt. It's still the same in Swiss German, in hand, so that gets even stronger. The Surin Hornhall uh, stung. Uh, what I think we also see is, I hope, 
blood is going to, choice is enjoyment in what the language can do and our form. You obviously must have had great pleasure in it. And it also it also reads well. So yeah, we go to Romanian. <clears throat> Thank you, Omar. Um, to, um, uh, to, to this sentence, um, actually, what, um, uh, what I said in the introduction uh, applies perhaps even better than um, for, the, um, for the introductory ex uh, example. Um, you can also see the, um, the quite excessive length to which uh, Ivanescu's sentence goes. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's a slow moving. Um, the, the the whole rhythm is, is quite different, and it, it would actually be possible to, to chant it like a sort of litany. Um, the um, uh, the alliteration is uh, is carried out systematically. With um, uh, we have syllabic uh, alliteration. Uh, we we also have um, um, alliteration on consonant um, consonant clusters. Um, both in um, front positions and uh, and positions in, in positions inside the uh, the words. Um, what um, um, what's also visible is that um, uh, in these repeated structures, um, lost to leave, lost to work. <laughs> um, the uh, what is repeated is merely the uh, the grammatical structure. Um, None, uh, none of the rhythm, <clears throat> none of the, um, none of the assonance um, is carried from um, from the one phrase to um, to, to the other. Um, well, the one's retranslation um, changes the uh, the picture quite uh, quite radically. Um, first of all, uh, this sentence perhaps comes as close as it <clears throat> uh, comes as close as possible. To um, to the uh, double thudding rhythm of um, of the original, um, you can see that the uh, the phrases are kept short. Uh, this is this comes from a combination of uh, <clears throat> of tense um, and obviously of uh, word choice. Um, it's a particular felicitous um, choice that um, in the middle of this uh, of this sentence. Um, Set phrase was found, which uh, which accidentally comes with a threefold alliteration. This don de duca, that uh, that would translate as uh, wanderlust, as uh, um, an appetite <coughs> lost to, um, to to travel. Um, and, and the last touch, um, in the last phrase, potrivnik um, zaplece, even um, even phonetically, um, uh, there is a um, there is a sensation of, uh, of a cluster of an impediment in Potridnik, which is then um, dissolved in, in this um, um, plosive liquid um, um, uh, cluster in our uh, uh, supply chain. Okay, thank you. We go back to the, the oh. German text again. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I thought the Ro uh, Romanian is a Latinized Romance language, and I thought I could guess my way through it, but I can't. You have to do something about it, Erica. <laughs> Not fair. Uh, the German is a bit more advanced uh, in the Middle Ages, and I just show it to see that if you know German, I mean, if you have learned, you would probably be lost and would have to read it very slowly. Uh, the spelling is different, that kind of thing, Niederkunft and things like that. And so you would almost have to translate every every word. Now, of course, Oxen is a translation it's anyway, because Joyce translates this modern English back in reverse into pseudo-historical uh, things, uh, major artifacts. And I say here, it is uh, when you come to Lenahan, that comes much later. Uh, you, in English, you can follow, but in German, you cannot. It might have the effect, I don't quite know, that people give up and, and skim it, which is, of course, not what we want. But um, as I say, here we go over from the, the, uh, the, the other way, and we use the slow development of spelling in German. 
don't have to read the report. The Chinese. <laughs> and now uh, to, to throw in another language, uh, for, for say, we have a Chinese student here in the foundation and I gave it to her and she has in the second line, she has, I'm not going to pronounce it, what it is, and she gives me a, a translation out of compassion. He traveled alone and traveled a long distance to this maternity hospital. Maybe with the travel and travel, there's something childish and simple in it. And she had uh, the good sense, I asked her, of course, to say, what would a Chinese reader think of it? And she quite bravely said in the brown, that is an expression that will go back to a certain age. And in the second thing, there's also something. That's the kind of thing we would like to know. And obviously, now Chinese, of course, has a long tradition and they, could, they, can, they can do many things. By the way, uh, in order to do this, when you have these really out of the, from uh, my Eurocentric point of view here, out of the way languages, the thing, the best thing would be ask somebody native, educated, who doesn't know the original. The Chinese student did it, but on the whole, it doesn't work because people freeze up. They think it's an intelligence test. And when you say Joyce, so you don't get what would be very simple. It's the, the thing that the fact that they do an experiment spoils the experiment, unless you have very clever people around you. Good. So we go back to Polish. Yeah, that, that Chinese example is very good for it. I, I, I deal with that a little bit with Russian Cyrillic transpositions that, again, what would you guess uh, uh, from, from seeing that? Um, so at any rate, we are at the centers that I, again, love very much. Woman's war would wonder pondering. And um, uh, it, it, I find the sentence for some reason very funny. But anyway, uh, uh, you will see, uh, of course, rhythm, uh, you'll see alliteration and that in, inner uh, wonder, ponder, that is a great, a great thing there. Now in Polish, I will read it to you to see whether you can hear what I'm trying to do here. Wniewia znoj z uznaniem wnikając. See, so I'm, I'm, I'm beating this rhythm there, but the pondering has to have three syllables in Polish, unfortunately. And the pondering per se doesn't really exist. It, it's a, a matter of transitive and transitive verbs, but he's looking into his thoughts about that woman's wool. Now, uh, the reason that I, and there's a sort of a chiasmic for, uh, formation if you look at the W and W in the beginning of, uh, and the last, in the beginning of last sentence, and then in, if, uh, in the middle. So you got this kind of a chiasmic formation, at least uh, uh, giving a reader a sense, hopefully, that there is something going on in the original. Now, um, if you click, Armand, thank you. Um, the reason that I am, again, looking at this sentence is because there are two more examples of woman's woo or woman's woo. So my whole point right now is leave everything behind and stick only with these three phrases to make sure or to find out whether I can indeed render them in the same manner. Um, and, and of course, implicitly what I'm doing is I'm sort of commenting on the fact that there's a certain sense of amnesia in some of the translations. They have been there, done, did, but forgot that the same phrase phrases kept keep repeating themselves. So I am kind of sort of tuned to that. So uh, these two uh, examples, I have uh, 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 rendered them. Um, he felt with wonder woman's woo. Uh, oh, sorry, those are the two. He felt with wonders woman uh, uh, who is uh, go to uznanie dla niewia znoju. So you will see niewia znoju from up, up there, the very first uh, 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 sentence. And the second one uh, from woman's wool is when, when uh, 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 Mulligan, com uh, uh, Mulligan comes into the hospital. So the second one uh, is translated as from woman's wool, uh, because of uh, the niewia and I can actually re, uh, reverse these words if I wish, but um, um, again, my, uh, Joyce didn't. So I'm trying to see if my language will actually
she bear that? And I'd like to add one more comment uh, that, uh, that Erica brought up that uh, I find very interesting. I never thought of these uh, uh, Polish renditions as somewhat like lit something like litany, but actually now that you, that you, that you talked about it, uh, uh, that, uh, that aspect of uh, Rarish's uh, uh, um, uh, translation, I can see how these sentences could uh, I could convince I could convince myself that they sound like a little bit like like litany. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, I wanted to, to interrupt. The uh, uh, that, that was about the first translator, um, the Ivanescu. No, oh, okay. Oh, it was Ivanescu. Oh, I see. Ah, okay. So he, so he's modernizing it much more than yeah. Okay, 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 okay. There's another it's little choice. It's a litany like. Okay, Fritz. Okay, sorry. Uh, there's another little Joyce in touch with wonder, pondering. In pondering is ponders a weight, and pregnant women are heavy. Hmm? And, and the pond, <laughs> yeah. So that's that too. Let's see if my no, mine, mine takes it into the brain. You see, so the pondering. Oh shoot, it won't work. I'll have to change it because yeah. it takes it into the brain rather than into the womb. Oh, you know, okay. one great handicap is. Everybody can bring up another aspect, yeah. and you can't deal with them all. <laughs> and another thing is, your readers, all your readers, will not pay the same attention that we do now. <laughs> but I think in your case, somebody, something will stick, and they will vaguely remember we had this before. With that, with that. Uh, hmm. it yeah, this sentence took me about like three days, so now I have to take it back to the drawing board to see whether I can bring it from brain down. But the brain births too, no, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. anyway, we'll see. <laughs> okay, and, thank and, you. And it's great training huh? <laughs> for the language, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Well, looking at the same sentence in Turkish, what you've done with it. Uh, here, um, with the wonder ponder, Ackman didn't do anything, but he illustrated the, the woman's move with this Czech teacher. And it is a standard uh, illustration phrase in Turkish of suffering, of if it's religious or like the, the, the pain for your um, wrongs kind of suffering. Uh, but, but the word for ponder is the regular thinking. So no heaviness or no introspection there. And also, I'm also using the same word, just um, thinking, but I'm trying to illustrate strong, in a stronger way Then I'm using the word woman, kadun, and I'm asking what I can do with, with that ka. So then you can think of the, uh, not the wu, but the, the lot, the fate of woman. So again, I'm changing the word. And kara kara is, kara is black, kara kara becomes adverb blackly, so gloomily. So then pondering gloomily about the lot of the women. And also you can say the end of the verb is also part of the illustrating group. Like, like a chiasmus, so yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of happy with it, but also Stephen will say, look, you changed the words. So that's the, the same, same dilemma there. And I, I picked up another nicely alternating phrase, two sentences, let the do with faith and fervor worship, with will will we withstand, with say. So Joyce is really having fun with the word will here also, linking to the Shakespeare episode. And again, Ackman is illustrating. So here is the, the grammar is helping us because things like fate, fervor, they usually have a historical Arabic and currently used um, equivalent. And they have a certain grammatical feature that they tend to start with I. So if trust the that. And then for this, also he's not blind. He starts from we, this, and then illustrates with B. And I do it similarly. So again, I have the similar alteration for faith and fervor. And then I'm really having fun with the with this sentence. So almost everything this bilakis bile bile bitavia biatsis. So every word is B now. But then to do that, then I'm changing almost every word. So if you tra translate them back, bilakis says on the contrary, bile bile is knowingly. Bitevia is continuously, and biat is a, is a made-up word. Everybody understands, but biat is submission. Still used very commonly in Turkish, but it used to be somebody accepting the new sultan and um, showing fealty to, to them. 
but biatsas you don't use, but you understand what it is. So it's also the same exchange thing. And when I look at it, I saw something else that is kind of interesting for translation choices. The word lute, it used to mean, uh, it, in, the, in the original day, it used to mean common people, lady. So it didn't have the current meaning of, of uh, sexually explicit, of course. It used to be just regular people who are unlearned. And there's a quite standard trope of religious rhetoric that certain things are for the common people, the, the, the surface meaning, but if you are learned, then you will know the, the underlying meaning and the two things. So I saw a bit of that sort of trope there. And again, if you are looking at historical English, historically, lute was something else. So Erkman translates lute as lecherous, but I go for laity. So in my translation, you don't see the feeling of this uh, coarse sexual language at all, but you see, let the common people worship, but we will do it differently. So these are also choices and you, you end up choosing one or the other. So this is also that the trans act of translation underlines certain meanings, but also completely washes over other meanings. And from here, we go back to Romanian. And, and now for something different. Um, this is a, a, a swift paced, uh, quite sprightly um, line that, um, uh, that comes with um, two archaisms, um, non in, in use anymore, uh, Levin and uh, Welkin. Uh, Welkin actually um, exists um, in, in German as Welke, meaning something else. So in, in some Germanic languages, the, um, uh, the root um, developed in a, in a different uh, direction. Um, the, um, uh, the two translations, again, uh, take, uh, take, take quite different uh, roots. Ivanescu tries to, uh, to, to follow suit with the L alliterations. Um, he, um, he employs lots of, uh, also lots of uh, consonantal clusters inside the, uh, the words. Um, and uh, in order to do that, uh, very interestingly, he, um, he opts for the word liquor. Uh, liquor would normally mean um, a very, uh, very weak glow. A uh, twinkle-like glow. It, um, uh, it, it also gives the name to the glow worm, uh, liquorich. Um, so you can um, <clears throat> you can uh, uh, imagine that kind of uh, uh, that kind of light rather than the, the flash of lightning. Um, so there is a, uh, an interesting, uh, but also there is this this kind of defamiliarizing effect in uh, uh, in the sentence uh, when you when you look at this this uh, uh, big twinkle um, <clears throat> that, uh, that that shakes the uh, firmament. Moldovan. Uh, um, goes again, um, as he does in most of these, uh, these early passages, for, um, for quite a lot of internal translation and word coinage. So in order to, um, uh, in order to produce uh, uh, um, a pointless alliteration uh, that, uh, that actually doesn't rely on the S's only, but on the, uh, on the cons uh, consonantal clusters, uh, S, F, uh, <clears throat> uh, and even S, T, R, um, he, um, he coins words, he, um, he makes up words, um, he, he attaches the S to fulger, the, the word, the descended word for, um, for lightning, um, a Latin word, word um, uses sturtekund, a very violent word for tearing apart, uh, and uh, comes up with stralumina. Um, the, um, the past tense uh, form, um, the, the combination of the, the, sub, the, the prefix tra and uh, lumina. Uh, stra, in, in this sense, in, in this position, can mean something like uh, trans, beyond, so excessively uh, lit up this, um, on the, the sky. Um, and in the second, second half of the, uh, of the sentence, he alliterates on um, C. Uh, um, for, uh, 
for which uh, he, he also uses krug, uh, a Russian derived word uh, that would be quite rare in, um, uh, in contemporary Romanian, and which initially means the, the, um, uh, the earth. Um, rather than the, the firmament, but, uh, which has this, uh, this dual meaning. Thank you. The original sentence is quite interesting, and uh, so is what Joyce does. Levin is a world we don't know for like stroke of lightning. Welkin uh, is sky. Now in German, Wolken is the clouds in the sky. And that shows also the semantic development of language. Uh, something up there uh, acquires a different meaning. It's, so it's not a, only a, uh, a word no longer there, but it's also a development that has a different meaning. And the whole chapter, by the way, is very much indebted to etymology. How we're drawing etymology makes every word the end product of a long development. And that's in a way what Joyce has. Just a bloom stay is a long development of Western culture. Yep. <laughs> yep. Then after the alterations, um, I compared the two Turkish translations for this workshop. And I come up to a single sentence that was so different, so diametrically opposite in the two versions. I thought it needed to be looked better into. Uh, it is this sentence. This is where this, uh, this is after the thunder. So Stephen is afraid, Bloom confers him, and then Stephen is questioned about his belief in God and nature and deaths and childbearing and all these things. So the narrator asks, would he not accept to die like the rest and pass away? And the answer is, by no means would he, though he must, nor would he make more shows according as man do with life, which phenomenon has commanded them. So this is the passage. And I noted that Ant-Man and myself are agreeing, disagreeing diametrically in the two points. And one point, uh, we, we, Ant-Man doesn't have anything at all. So the, in the Ant-Man's translation, back translated, this by no means would he is, of course, he would accept. And then would he make more shows in Ant-Man? He had no intention to do more than the math. And then the, the, the middle thing that Dom he must is missing. In mine, the, the first answer would he is he did not want by any means. So no. And then I have for the though he must, I have all the, although he was forced to. And in my translation, he would like to stage many more shows with matches. So I am understanding it completely differently. Uh, for the Turkish readers, he has a Turkish text. Um, so I, I decided, to, yes, we need to look into this. It's the key sentence and how come we are disagreeing so badly. So when I start looking into it, of course, the English sentence, even if you didn't know Ulysses, Joyce, anything else, just looking at the passage, is a difficult uh, to, to parse. First, would he not accept? Uh, so in such sentences where you, the question is in neg negative, actually the English yes or no doesn't mean anything. Uh, is it not? Yes, it is. Is it not? No, it is not. Is it not? Yes, it is not. <laughs> is it not? No, it is not. So yes or no doesn't mean anything. So you can't be confused. So you can say by no means would he accept. This is what I read. And you can say by no means would he not accept. This is how I manage it. But actually, if you look at the text, the following phrase, though he must, is clarifying that he doesn't accept, but he must accept. So here I think Altman is mistaken, but you can understand it differently. And then second, that word according, what does it do? So is it according to what just Stephen said? Is it according to by no means, no, he must? This is how I read it. Or is it according to other men? This is the way Art Man reads it, which I think I don't agree, but I can understand. So I can understand that you can, understand, you can read the sentence like that. So the meaning is there, if you see that. And also, it could be something else. It could be according to the law of phenomenon. And it could be something else that I couldn't think of. So these are all the difficulties for translators. And the third thing, what does Joyce mean by make more shows? Is it make more children, make more human life? Because the previous sentence is human life is a passing show. Or is it have sex with women, not necessarily by having children, 
and actually it is the population without population discussion that is following that sentence. So all the students say, repeat that they want to have sex, but they will use contraceptives. So this is how I understood it. And one, one would probably see what Bunyan does with the word chosen. Maybe you yeah. find it there. Yeah, I should look I, at I, it. Yeah. I yeah. But I mean, imagine the, the time you spend going to sources to find nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, and, you often have these collocations when you don't quite know which parts of the sentence belong together. Yeah. That's part of it. So the text is different. And um, the, the, the text is difficult, but also to make it so the translator can understand the text differently, but also the text itself has not been stable. So it was for the 62 years, the, the use of the publication, it was like this. It was by no means would he and make more shows. So it was a clear yes. And that to me at that time, when I did translation, sounded much more like Stephen because Stephen in the previous uh, chapters, uh, he's looking for the, the, uh, the Anne Hathaway to come and seduce him and all those. And we know Joyce was a family man. So I would expect Joyce or Stephen to be um, somebody who would make more shows. So this is why I probably, I was blind to that nor. So I clearly made a mistake. And that's a nice also, I think, um, model tale for translators. It is when you are confused, you will look it up. When you don't understand, you will look it up. But when you are sure of your meaning, that you are so much empathized to the, to the character that I think that Stephen thinks like this, you can do such mistakes and don't check it later on. So I, I didn't see that nor. But maybe also I was using the... Um, the um, the Jerry Johnson text is a facsimile of the 1922 with the changes at the back. So I passed the change in, but I was looking at that and also, so maybe that also made me astray. So it, it, it got changed into what we have. And what happened is that though he must was inserted, clarifying the first part, and and was replaced by nor. So this is the text we have today. So also the text itself has been changing. And my conclusion is that Joyce wrote it, we know, then it got changed before it got published, it became and, and most of the authorities, most of the translations go for nor, even if there is some disagreement even today. But you see that the text itself can be ambiguous, the text itself can be flipping meanings after 60 years, so these are some of the choices that we as translators force ourselves see ourselves the first to make. And from here, I go back to for examples. Uh, yes, the, um, um, the following is a, um, is a string of examples to, um, to the whole translation can also deal with um, with a sense of, uh, of, a, of a language that's somehow somewhat inchoate, uh, that is in constant flux, uh, a language in the pre-standardized um, phases of development, uh, but also a language that, um, uh, that uh, to a certain point lacks uh, standardized grammar, uh, lacks a, um, a stable lexis, uh, where uh, words can fluctuate, there is even gender fluctuation, there is um, um, great fluctuation of form or, of inflection, and um, uh, where there is a constant um, uh, upload of uh, translations and loan words from, uh, from different languages. Um, one, of the, one of the wonderful features, I think, of the upcoming translation is um, uh, is a constant uh, tongue in cheek approach to, um, to, to this semblance of um, uh, gestation of language in the womb, to, to, this, uh, to, to what we might expect to be a scholarly approach to, uh, to different phrases in language development. Um, and for sure, we know that um, uh, the choice himself 
sprinkled oxen with lots of inconsistencies. Uh, the, um, uh, the sky parodies are systematically jumbled, uh, and uh, they are really peppered with, uh, with lots of in-jokes, uh, with lots of um, 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 uh, double entendres. Um, there is a, a, an enormous amount of joking of Winks and the reader, um, and, uh, and, and we will remember that famous letter to, um, to the bottom that uh, the, the details of the, the grandiose project announced on how that were high. So um, a few instances of um, how a translator can deal creatively with, uh, uh, with such features. <coughs> um, one of the interesting um, sentences in the early passage uh, is this Museums it dureth overlong, uh, where um, the, the English reader comes up against the um, comes up against an unfamiliar, suddenly unfamiliar word. Uh, we all seem to understand it, but it's strange, and because of the strange form, it um, um, it, it takes on different connotations. It takes on um, uh, different words. Um, well, the one's version, Parimisika uh, Dureshte Pralung, um, has the, to, to me, the, um, um, the, the great feature of telescoping, of bringing together the, um, the, the standard word, Duraza, uh, for to last, and uh, a cluster of words that, uh, that go back to a root um, <clears throat> um, that, uh, that, um, that is shared between such words as um, pain, as uh, to, to hurt, uh, but also in one of the words that he uses throughout for compassion, um, literally hurting with. Um, so this, um, uh, this kind of telescoping uh, is also enhanced by a feature of Romanian grammar, the, uh, the implied subject. The sentence has an implied subject and we don't know if it's uh, neutral, it, um, it could be, uh, it seems to me that it, that is the, the birth, the, um, the, the labor, uh, so belong, but it could also be that it's she, the, uh, the, the woman, <laughs> this is uh, uh, Miss Purefoy, who uh, hurts Ovalong. Uh, the, second, uh, the second example is, uh, uh, again, a famous instance, the anastomosis of labor courts, uh, one of the key passages in the, uh, uh, in the Oxen about uh, um, filiation, about um, uh, origins and, uh, and generation. And um, here Madhuan uh, uh, fashions a great portmanteau, uh, anastomoatele vulculi. It, uh, uh, it can read as a, um, as a heavy handed uh, attempt at, um, uh, at carrying across this Greek word into, um, in, into some kind of theory of Romanian, some kind of faked archaic Romanian. Uh, but it, uh, it just happens to, to chime in with Matsele, uh, that is the bowels. And Matsele is, uh, uh, is again, an, uh, uh, is, is quite an earthly word. Um, so the, uh, the, this combination of, uh, uh, of pretentious um, foreign term with, uh, with this very earthly um, um, word for the, for the viscera, for the entrails, um, and, and locating the whole thing in the navel um, rather than um, rather than alluding to the um, umbilical cords is, uh, is is one more such feature of, uh, <clears throat> of internal defamiliarization. Uh, and the last one in this series is his rendition of uh, <clears throat> of a gambire. Uh, something that, uh, that that reverberates through the text so is the uh, again by the inwit. Um, and uh, this, of course, alludes to, uh, to, to different phases of translating um, usually Latin concepts uh, into languages which didn't yet have them. Uh, and these translations were most of the time um, word for word and, uh, and literal. Yaris um, Cumparator will rings uh, like both one of these translations and, uh, and a smart portmanteau. Uh, uh, yara, Yarish means again. Uh, ras comparator is the combination of, uh, of a prefix, uh, Ras again, and uh, or backward, 
and uh, um, kumpara to, to buy. It's also the, the standard word for um, to redeem, the, the redeemer. Uh, and it manages to, to bring together those um, uh, those two words. It's it's actually um, somewhat clumsily tautological. Again, again, fire. Thank you. Uh, Agen Bayer is, by the way, a, a, a fits well because the Christian has a lot of new concepts uh, from Greek, Latin, and they had they translated that. And Redeemer was translated as Agen Bayer, just as Agen Bite, uh, remorse of conscience. And that is a word that did not survive. It is a kind of, a, it fell by the way, wayside, it, um, a kind of Darwinian dead end. And, uh, and by the way, Stephen treasures these words, huh? and Joyce too, probably. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it looks like we have about 10 minutes left for questions. It looks like we've finished. Are we, Erica? Oh, did I just interrupt you? Yes, okay. Um, um, uh, there, 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 there may be people who want to ask something of us, so please feel free to do that. Uh, uh, you know, we can talk about lucky solutions that we run into, things that we simply cannot translate, but of course there are translators in the audience and it would be great to hear uh, their, their commentary. Now, I am not very good at manning the, the chat room, so I think I will ask both Arman and, uh, and Casey to, to, to help me with this and just feel free to direct the questions to people. I just, I'm just don't have that kind of mind. Um, all right. We, we just get some praise from a fellow Romanian uh, who is uh, uh, praises the Moldovan translation. Yeah, okay, that's good, great. Uh, I, I think Dirk has his hand up. Okay, oh yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you very, very much for this wonderful panel. I have a comment rather than a question. Fritz has pointed out absolutely correctly that in the German translation, Oxen of the Sun is tricky, intricate, can be frustrating. It's a hell of a lot to read. But on the Bloomsday Centennial in 2004, I was on a panel with Wolschläger and he gave a reading of it. Within a few minutes, the audience was basically falling off their chairs laughing. It was the first time I did not have to explain to the audience that James Joyce can be fun because it was absolutely hilarious when it was read out loud. So the reading, the visual is the problem far more than the audible. When we hear it, it is perfectly understandable, even if unusual, and it is absolutely funny. That's also true of the original. These dense passages, when they're read well, you totally understand it and follow them, and they can be funny. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, also, this where I had the most fun, some of the most fun passages in Turkish as well, indeed. Mm -hmm. There's something in the remarks that uh, Neza Fakman, the first translator, he passed away from COVID mm -hmm. uh, last year, I think around last May. So, indeed, we need to commemorate him. That's, yeah. He's one of the people that I know that's, that's come to, to do this. Uh, no, but I have another remark. Um, Joyce, I think you could say, was a bit on the arrogant side at times. Huh? <laughs> uh, and uh, since he was very ambitious, challenging Dante and Goethe and Homer and all of that, Shakespeare, uh, he must have felt, must do the kind of my speculation, that uh, if you want to say something new, you can't say anything new, and you can no longer write like Swift or somebody like that. And I think Joe said, the hell, I can't. I can do it only better than the others. So it's also a kind of challenge. And of course, what, you, what I always said, you can see the enjoyment of these old forms. So, and sometimes they reach across. Mm -hmm with all the distance of time. Hey, uh, 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 Joanna has a hand up. Yes, go ahead. I have a question for you, Yolanta, because I speak of Serbian. I am wondering why, when you translated Oxen of the Sun in the two variants, the 1473, 14.73, so the chapter 14 lines, Line seventy-three. Okay. Your first, um, your first slide. 
uh, you used Bliz Niemo mm -hmm. in one case. Right. In the second one, Bliz Niego. Yes. Could you explain why you uh, changed uh, for, for um, well, the, it could have been either uh, of those words in any uh, in the, both of those sentences. The the second one shows that Samjal dla bliźniego is slightly more correct in Polish. You feel a, 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 a Ruth for somebody, whereas in the first one bliźniemu uh, it 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 tilts the sen uh, uh, grammar of the sentence. But you're absolutely right. I could have uh, I should have probably shown on a slide that can be either or. So uh, if, if that answers your question, if, if the point would be to how can I antiquize uh, the language, okay? So yeah, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. And so, uh, right, so right here you will see uh, the, it, it, in, in pinkish uh, uh, that it, it's, it's slightly less normal uh, word to, to, to use. But I can use either of these words in my sentences in order to show that I'm trying to make a syntax a, 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 a slightly antiquated. So that's all there's to it. But thank you for pointing it out. I will have to make the choice and that's the worst part, you know, because I have all these various, I only show you two or three, but oh, I, I have the whole page of them. And, oh, uh, criticism, a piece of criticism. Criticism at all, so I was just wondering yeah, yeah. what. So yeah. which is the more archaic, The first one, yes. The first one would be syntactically slightly more archaic. Yes, it would indeed. Um, thank yeah. You. And, thank you. yeah, thank you. And yeah. Yeah, Robert Yan has. Uh, oh, okay. Are, are you done? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I was actually going to ask uh, uh, Erika. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Ian. You, you, Robert Yan. I'm sorry. You. You. My, my Romanian colleague, on the other hand, in her slide, but I didn't uh, write down exactly where, uh, when you used uh, for forlorn, uh, you, you translated uh, forlorn as orphaned uh, in, uh, to, to explain to our colleagues in English what the meaning of Ivanescu's translation in forlorn. I, I, Probably it was the same, the same uh, first slide. You used orphan. And um, there is, well, the, the more, I don't know, I wondered why, why you felt like using orphaned, which um, does not really mean forlorn. It's too specific, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I'm, I'm conscious of, uh, uh, of banding that translation a bit, uh, because to, um, I, can we eventually go back to that slide, um, Arman? It was the first one. The, uh, the, the first one. Yes, it was the first. Um, yeah, um, uh, that, that was right. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, yeah, I, I, I did band consciously uh, a little bit because to, to my mind it added a bit of this um, um, of uh, of a sense of being stripped of a companion. Um, yeah, After. here it is. Unsingulat. A companion yeah, is not. The, uh, the, the meaning should be plain. Yeah. Because it, it twists the meaning towards uh, rel uh, relative. So yeah, here my, family yeah, family my, like, my, my Maybe it was a, a, Freudian, a Freudian slip and you were thinking of Molly or what. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Thank you very much. So I was. Okay, so, Robert Yan. I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank I, you. I didn't mean orphan. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I don't really have a question, but I must say that. Uh, uh, sorry, just to, uh, uh, to, yeah. to answer. Oh. Yes, well, can I? Yes. No? Yes. <laughs> all right, all right. No, I, I, I translated the yes, Ulysses with, the, with Eric, and uh, um, I must say we had the most fun with the Oxen of the Sun uh, chapter. It's also because we could, we could get material from the entire Dutch literature and uh, and put it in uh, the strangest words and uh, and and they all fell into fell into place and I don't uh, and when we read it when we read it and when we are reading it it's it uh, it also just like Derek said uh, it it uh, it's uh, um, uh, it works for the audience 
Uh, so, and I can't understand this, uh, the, the new French translators, by the way, that they just took over the old Morel yeah. translation because <laughs> the French literature is so rich, they could, they could have really their fun. Uh, this is actually <laughs> the auction of the sun is the reason that you start translating, start translating Ulysses. They have all of Rabelais huh, to take from. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Rabelais. Rabelais. <laughs> Yeah, and but 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 about this uh, this uh, Wolschläger, uh, the, does he makes uh, such strange old-fashioned Dutch uh, uh, German words? It's of course he's a bit che cheating uh, because Joyce could have uh, done the same uh, in old orthographic uh, English, uh, uh, right in old orthographic Beowulf English, but he didn't. So uh, it, it, it's it, he, he archaic. He's he making it archaic, but uh, in in a cheating way, I think. So, but but still, if it works, it works. Huh? That's all, and I, I don't. I'm. I was very glad with this panel, and I'm the most glad that to see that we are not crazy after all. <laughs> you get. You gave a new synonym for translating, cheating. Hmm? Cheating. My cheating. God. Cheating. Yeah, that's cheating. <laughs> illusion. Illusionism. You create the illusion that the text in hundred years ago is actually. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, uh, uh, Robert Jan, that really helps me because I, I, the, when I began to translate that, 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 you know, that Latinite beginning, I was writing to Fritz and just, just being in total despair because you don't know what it says in English. So, um, uh, But uh, it, 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 it helps me to see that I'm not the only one struggling, but also, indeed, the, the sentences that I chuckle over, I need to uh, remember that, that, that they indeed are funny. So uh, thank you for that comment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially when it's all finished and there's no more little little snails to put salt on, but then it, it starts being a, a complete uh, uh, entirety of. Well, then let's ask Arman why is he doing the fourth edition, right? I mean, there are always changes. People always oh, rework. We have five editions, and we also we have every every time we make uh, changes and uh, and and, and uh, emendations every time. No. So you never finished. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, somebody who doesn't know the original should back translate the auction into English. Hmm? Throw it into Google. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. If I may um, uh, chime in, uh, I, I absolutely love both Romanian translations of Oxen. Um, even this course is, it, I, I think it's really uh, a cultural event and it's, um, uh, it, it had a huge impact on literature. Uh, and uh, it, it's simply one of the most inventive uh, things in, in translation that I know of. Uh, but uh, more than comes with uh, with this much um, lighter handed approach. Uh, it, it's really sprinkled with um, with all the all the in jokes from the beginning, all the double entendres, all the um, I, I'm sorry, in a sense, in, in a way that I couldn't get to, um, uh, to to the next example, which would be a, would have been a, a wonderful cacophony strategically used. Um, and, and it's really full of these, um, the, these funny mistakes, because it, it also reflects on, um, on the ways that notions of good form change during the, the centuries. Uh, what was still okay to, uh, to, to put in a literary text at the beginning of the 19th century and then would elicit a goffo um, 80 years ago, <laughs> afterward. Uh, but it also, it, it also has lots of, uh, um, lots of these um, um, coded misuses and then parapraxis that, uh, that became a big thing because some of our politicians um, gaffed uh, with them, and uh, and you can really uh, get all the layers of um, all the, all these you know all these funny mistakes that uh, that are there. Well, I, I like your comment about the politician gasping because, you know, Polish Ulysses also came under a, a, a communist uh, regime and there are very funny uh, sort of a dating, uh, uh, words that date the, the, the translation from comrade to all sorts of other uh, 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 vocabulary, but um, um, it, uh, Swamczynski erred on the side of vulgar when he didn't have, to, when he could be just funny, he was going vulgar. And so, so it, I, I, I've spoke about that before, but there are certain things that I also am, 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 am pondering things like impossibilities. And for some reason, Swamczynski translated mother church 
uh, as a matka church, uh, costume. Now, the problem with these two words, one is feminine and one is masculine. So you cannot have a costume that is feminine. You know, it just simply does not live in our language. So was he, you know, commenting on on the, on the clandestine church in Poland at that time or not? But uh, is, that is one of the things I cannot resolve. Right. Yeah, but I don't know how to resolve that. I don't know really how to say Mother Church in 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 in. No, he he just the head of the Vatican. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Way ahead, miles ahead. Mm -hmm. But those of you in languages where you have the gender, I mean, what 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 did you translators do? I mean, we have Robert Young. Do you remember um, how you dealt with it? You would need Robert to Young, unmute you're yourself. Muted. Yeah, you, I mean, if you unmute yourself, love, we'll hear all your wisdom. Yeah, Thank you. I, I can I can understand what Slomzinski does because yeah, you have to appropriate the text uh, yourself. If you think this is funny in a way, then you should you should do it. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, erring on the vulgar, vulgar side, it sounds not very bad oh. to me either. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> yeah, when you say he vulgarized it or made it uh, uh, obscene, uh, most translations do the other, the other thing. Often, yeah. for state reasons, they have to uh, to bowderize yeah. them. So that's again a kind of compensation. But culturally, he was so well known in Poland that they would have allowed him to, to, to do that the way they would not allow a, a, a sort of an unknow, unknown person. So, yeah. so. He could yeah, get a way of it. An in, in invisible translator who translates just what, what, is, what is said is impossible. You have to uh, yeah, right. put your stamp on it. Yeah, you have to have a vision, and 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 the stronger the vision is, the stronger the uh, the, the translation will work out. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I may chime in with the uh, with the gender bending, uh, that that's one of the great features of uh, both Romanian translations, uh, because for for a relatively long time, um, <clears throat> from the from the late eighteenth century through at least the first half of the of the nineteenth, um, there was this. Um, uh, that this language renewal movement that uh, that uploaded many many um, Latin and uh, French words into the into the vocabulary, but um, uh, sometimes they were quite volatile. So they they would change gender, they would change form, and there is really a, a great and, and fantastically exuberant play on, on some of these words. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, they are made even more pretentious, even more. Um, you know, even more comic, um, uh, even more comically um, pretentiously used than, uh, uh, than they would normally have been in, um, in those texts which lead to translator's mind. Uh, and sometimes they are really strategically um, employed in, in situations where, you know, that the, the standard word is, uh, let's say, masculine, and, and it's used in a uh, in a feminine context and is gendered feminine, and so that, that can be really great fun. To, yeah. I can't can't give examples of the cough, but I, I think there is a question coming. Let's see. We have, uh, yeah, we have a hand up, so you need to unmute yourself, love. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello. Welcome, stay everybody. Okay, um, thank you. And I wanted to ask uh, Arman Bey a question as a Turkish speaker myself. Um, um, uh, I wonder if you, uh, were there any uh, aspects of the Turkish language uh, that you, that helped you while translating the Oxen uh, or maybe transformed uh, your trans, uh, translation uh, as a whole? Uh, any aspect of, you know, Turkish language um, maybe somehow complicated things a little bit, uh, but also, you know, added some kind, uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, um, a valuable aspect uh, to your translation of the Oxen. Thank you. So the, this Turkish language reform uh, managed to really change the language in the 1960s. So most of the literature from 1960s onwards is readable for most of us except for the, some of the radical uh, purifiers that they invented lots of words. So many of them got caught on, some of them did not. So the ones that did not catch on look very strange, but actually there are lots of hundreds, maybe thousands of words that they invented or revived and we just understand now. 
So the, the, the more you go back from the 1950s, you have all these layers of archaism. So Tankunard is this big writer of the 50s, is difficult to follow for most modern readers in the dictionary for some words. So you can you can create these layers of um, archaism. So that helps. And uh, of course, yeah, you you look at uh, you look at words that sound like the other words that will help the the sum of the play Joyce's making. It, at least not literally, but with other words, you can repeat similar tricks. So that helped a lot. And yeah, sometimes you happen to translate a sentence correctly. And that sounds very much like something else in Turkish, which would fit Bloom's mind completely. So if Bloom were Turkish, he would make the same joke. So those kind of happy coincidences happen. All right. Um, um, I am getting signals from people who record the session that we are way over time, which I swear I haven't noticed. So and, and I would like to uh, give Fritz last word and then just one minute if you have something to say Fritz and then I would like to thank everybody for joining our session and and providing such a good listening ear. Fritz would you like to say something at the last word? What makes you think I have something to say? Um, uh, but uh, I think we also offered a crash course in Turkey to Romanian and uh, and Polish so yeah. people should be grateful. Yeah. Thank you. Be. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.